the grapevine with Adrian Crowley. And you're welcome back to the programme. The controversy of the last number of weeks in relation to the Tuam mother and baby home reflects badly, to say the very least of it, on both church and state. And since then, much discussion has taken place uh, on radio, television and elsewhere as to the treatment meted out to the mothers and what exactly happened to their infants. I'm joined on the line now by uh, a lady who went to Dunboyne uh, Mother and Baby Home in 1983 and whom I'm simply going to refer to as Mary. Uh, Mary, good evening to you. Good evening, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, and thank you very much indeed for taking our call this evening. Thanks. Mary, you were 18 in 1983 when you went to Dunboyne. That's um, correct, yeah. Was there a discussion within your family as to how this would be dealt with, or was it automatically assumed that you would go to some place like Dunboyne? It wasn't discussed with me. Um, it would have been discussed um, with obviously members of the family and other um, bodies like the doctor, the local doctor and um, the local priest. And between that, they, they, they organised it. And I, I knew nothing about it um, until I was told that you're, you're going away. And how many weeks were you pregnant at that stage? I would have been um, about five and a half, six months um, pregnant at that time. So you were simply told you're going to Dunboyne, that's it? Yeah, that's it. Now, I don't want you to tell us what part of the country you come from, but was Dunboyne uh, quite a distance from where you were brought up? Yeah, it was quite a distance. Um, I remember at the time, um, um, it, it just seemed like it, uh, miles and miles and miles and miles away. It really was very far away. And, I mean, there was a method to that as well. Like, they didn't want anybody to know mm. that I was expecting a child. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't do the blame game. I don't do blame anybody because sure. if I did blame someone for that, then it would hurt me more than it would hurt. So I don't do, you know, the blame. I just, I just ended up there. But, um, and, and when you were told that you were going there and that you obviously had no choice in the matter, mm. wh what was your own reaction? I think my own reaction was a mixed reaction because the atmosphere was so bad. And at I was home, terrified. is it? Yeah, at home. And um, I was terrified of anybody noticing that I was expecting, so I was very, very small. And... Um, so it was, you know, it was very concealed, and and it was, um, and I mean that was proven because the next day, um, I I was just I had grown so much mm. from just the relief of being, I suppose, where other pregnant girls were. And when you arrived in Dunboyne, can I just ask you what you know? Here you are, eighteen years of age, five and a half months pregnant. Um, wh what? What was it like? What was the procedure once you got there? Oh, it was very daunting. It was so daunting. Um, the place was huge. Um, massive big doors. And you were brought in. Um, and then you were brought into a room where you were given tea and it was all nice days. But then you went into, when your family left or whoever left you there left, they, you were brought into the other side of the, the house where the pregnant girls were. And you were just kind of said, well, this is where you're going. And um, say, for an example, Ursula, can you look after this girl? And then this girl, would, Ursula, would take you round and show you where you were going to be sleeping. And the place was absolutely huge. It was an old convent and it was just dark and really scary. Um, and for somebody that had never been away from home before, it was, it was horrific. And that first night, Mary, did you feel uh, that your family had abandoned you. I know you don't want to play the, the, the blame um, game, but your own feelings that night, that at a very vulnerable time in your life, uh, that your family had essentially abandoned you. Yeah, I guess, yeah. Yeah, that would be true to say, yeah. And that night, that first night, did you feel terribly alone? That, that first, the whole time, I, I just cried myself to sleep. The first night I, I arrived there, I was so scared, I actually wept to bed. I was so scared. I just didn't know what was coming. I didn't know what to expect. And I was just so very homesick. 
And then very, very homesick. The, the, the following morning then, a, a new day dawns, um, were you awoken early? What was the procedure? Yeah, you were woken early. You were given, I was away. The house was very, very big. There was like oh, three or four, five stories, but I was away, way up at the very top. And it was um, it was attached to the actual convent end. So the girl that I had to share the room with, she went to Mass every morning, so she escorted me to Mass for, I think it was like half six in the morning. And then you went then and you had your breakfast and um, from breakfast then you, you went and you did your chores. Like, we all worked for our keep. You know, you didn't stay there for free. You worked. Mm. You, we ran we ran the convent, basically. We ran the, the, the home, you know, by we did all the chores, all the cleaning and all the cooking and that sort of stuff. Um, and then um, in the afternoon, some of the girls went to school in in the convent and some of the girls went to do cards Um and um, stuff cards into envelopes for ours men. <clears throat> so it was it was very menial work. It was, yeah. It was, you know, it wasn't hard labour mm. or anything. Sure, but sure. It, it, it had to be done. But there was um, um, one of the problems I have is um, I didn't get on with one of the girls in the kitchen. I don't know why. And then they sent me over to the convent to clean up after the nuns and it was just horrific, you know, it was just, um, it was just, um, left me very scared about porridge for all things. <laughs> it was one of the, one of the nuns insisted on eating porridge every day and it was just stuck to the pot and it was just, it was horrible. And can I just ask you, b- before we ask you about your relationship with the nuns, d- as the weeks went by, did you begin to form relationships with other girls who were there or at least some of them? Yes, I did. Um, I, I found a very good friendship with one of the girls. And she was quite knowledgeable. She was younger than me, but she was quite knowledgeable about things, you know, about um, what effect iron tablets had on you and that sort of stuff. Because we had no, there was no education. There was no, what was happening to our bodies. Um, mm. What, what you know, how your body was changing. And obviously we were we were pregnant. We had bumps, but we didn't know what was going to happen after that and we didn't we you know we knew nothing about um when the baby was going to be born, how we were going to feel or mm. um there was no kind of there was no counselling, we counselled with each other. Um, you know, and a lot of the talk would have been, Are you keeping your baby, are you not? Uh, <clears throat> whereas before before I went there I had no intentions of um not keeping my baby. Mm. But when you got there you were influenced by you know, the talk of the other guys and then the t- social workers would come in um, and each in, week. And in terms of your your own health and, and the, the progression of the pregnancy, would there be access to a doctor or a nurse? There would be. One of the nuns was a, a midwife, as far as I remember, but when you were taken into Holler Street for your, your checkups and your scans and stuff like that. Um, we were all piled on a bus, and you, can you imagine, like twenty pregnant girls coming into um, a, into a hospital? You know, one it, younger than the other. You know, it's an it's an image that's hard to um, that, 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 that that's hard to believe. Yeah, it's it's as an, an twenty of you being get. piled into this bus and being brought into Hollis Street. Yeah, and paraded in front of everybody. And did you find that humiliating? Oh God, yeah. I remember there was three of us kind of hung around together and I was, would have been the smallest of the three and I remember, you know, with the Dublin accent, it was, Jesus, look at your one, and then, Jesus, look at your one, Jesus, look at your one. You know, and it was, it was, it was horrible. And was then horrible. In, in relation to the um, interaction between you and the nuns, uh, what was that like? Well, the nuns, didn't really, um, there was only one nun really that kind of interfered because um, I think they all kind of had their own jobs mm. where this one seemed to look after you if you needed your money or whatever, she would be in the office. But it wasn't so much the nuns in the place, it was actually the, the nun that came from outside. This nun that I was involved with came from Sligo um, from the St. Attractor's Adoption Agency and it was her that was... Um, uh, I wouldn't say counselling, I would say coaching. Coaching me that the best thing for me and for my baby was adoption. And, and that would have been on a weekly basis. 
so it 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 was effectively uh, creating in your mind uh, doubts about you having uh, you oh. keeping your child and yeah. you know voluntarily giving your child up for adoption. Yeah. And how much I would help another family if I did that, the pers- people that couldn't have children. And and it was all done, well, first of all, by nuns who wouldn't have had experience anyway, but by it was done, we didn't have an experience. We, I didn't know what giving birth was going to be like. I didn't know what holding my baby was going to be like. Mm. You know, I was, there was none of that. There was no coaching of that. Um, I do remember one of the girls coming in after her baby was born and saying to me, hold on to your baby for as long as you can. Sorry. That's okay, Mary, that's, uh, that's okay. You, but, um, but it was it was a constant, um, I call it pecking, when you went in the door, it, it started, your baby will be better off without, not without you. They didn't put it like that, they put it that your baby would be better off, will have a better life, would be able better provided with two parents. Mm. And, you know, and then you have people working on on the boyfriend saying, you know, you, you're too young and that sort of stuff. And, and did um, that happen in your case in relation to yeah. the father of the child? Yeah. And who who, who would have who would have engaged in that behaviour? Um, family members. Your family or his family or both? Probably both, but more so mine. And can I ask you, did, did your boyfriend of the time, did he visit you in Dunboyne? He did. He did a few times. And then, um, um, and just the, the peck and just kept at it and yes. he's no good and he's not coming off and enough and he's not going to do this and he's not going to do that and he said he wouldn't marry and, you know, so it was all a, a pecking of, of him as well. And eventually we, we, um, we broke up. Um, and Mary, you know, when did you decide to? Well, first of all, the 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 circumstances surrounding the birth. I presume everything went well, and your baby was born healthy and well. She was. She was. We don't. Um, the 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 birth went well. And we'd been to labour in the middle of the night, and it was dropped off at Hollow Street by taxi, and was left on my own. Um, and I gave birth to her, and even after I gave him birth, I wasn't just a hundred percent sure about how I felt. But it was when the um, the nurse said, "Do you want to take her upstairs?" And I said, "Yeah." And they put her into my arms, and then I knew that I was in big trouble. Why? I just felt such overwhelming love for this child that was mine, and they were going to take her from me. And I knew I had a real struggle in my hands. Because there was no way I was going to get to keep her. Did you realise that already? As soon as they put the child in my arms, they say there's nothing like a mother's bond with her child. And they're right. And Mary, did did your parents and siblings see your daughter? Uh, My mum. Only your mother? Yeah. And... Only my mum when she was a baby. Did your mother perhaps feel differently once the, the baby was born? Or did your mother, did you, did she not? Well, I think, I think back again, as I said earlier, I don't do the blame game, but yes. I think society had a lot to do with that as well. Mm. You know, at the time, as you said earlier, it was never talked about. The, what would the neighbours say? What would the local priests say? You know, you can't expect me to take, as they called them at the time, God forgive me, illegitimate children. Mm. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and, and there was, you know, it was a terrible stigma on society. And Mary, when the, the baby was a few days old, did you return then to Dunboyne? Well, they let me um, look after her for five and a half days. In and, Dunboyne, is it? Uh, no, no, no. There was never any babies in Dunboyne when I was there. Um, right. This was in, in Holler Street. Okay. And when it would come to visiting time, because I had no visitors, um, they would cordon off the curtains so nobody could see me. And um, then um, I had to leave her behind because I was promised by the social workers that they would pick her up from Holler Street. That was part of, you know, I wasn't going to give her up unless she went straight to her adoptive parents. And um, they didn't come. They didn't come to pick her up. They were late. 
So I had to walk away. I had to walk out of the hospital and leave her behind me, which was one of the worst things that anybody could have done to me. Mary, in in a period of five and a half days, the the adoptive parents had been identified and told to call to Hollis Street Hospital to pick up your daughter. No, it was actually actually the social worker that was to pick her up. But the, the adoptive parents already knew. They already knew she was coming. And, and that was before I'd even made up my mind. And w- were you put in an absolutely invidious position where you were given documentation to sign and to consent to all of this? Yeah, not at the time, but, but um, a few months down the line, yeah. And no matter what avenue I went down to try and keep her, uh, I was blocked by, by um, social workers. And did you yourself, you know, you had those five and a half days with your baby daughter. Yeah. Uh, you, you shared the first five and a half, half days of her yeah. life. Yeah. Um, you know, at the end of that, had you said to yourself, I, I don't want this to happen? Oh, I knew I didn't want it to happen. But back then, it was, it was you know, it would be easy if, you know, for me to stand up and say that now 35 years later. Yes. No chance. But back then, you're a young, vulnerable woman, girl. Something has just happened to you that you don't, is unexplainable to you. And, you know, and nobody explained to any of us, any of us girls, what was going to happen to us. And when you you left, when you left Hollis Street for the last time and leaving your baby behind you, had you no support from family or friends or... No, it was just a case of um, telling the taxi driver that the baby wasn't well and had to stay in hospital. And then I had to go back to Dunboyne that night, which was terrible. And I was taken back home the next day. And my family got on with with their business and I just cried for months after it, years after it. And was was it as clinical as that? You know, you go back to Dunboyne on the last night and then back yeah. home to your family and was it ever discussed then subsequently no 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 ever Unless, when, when i brought it up saying that i didn't want this to happen um but i was i was just fought at every corner and um, no matter what avenue i took it was it was um blocked it just wasn't going to happen and they had such an influence you know in them do- days like you know you did as you were told Sure, I appreciate Even that fully. It was something as horrific as what it was. But you just did as what you were told. And uh, as you got older, did you get involved in other relationships or well, what did I, you do? Um, I, I'd never, I never had any other children um, because I didn't want her to think that I didn't want her. I always wanted her to know that I wanted her. Yes. Um, and so I didn't go on to have any other children. I'm married and I'm very happy. Um, and got my little dog and I have met my daughter and it's lovely. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Yeah. Did, did did your daughter seek out you or did you seek out her? No, she, she her, her, her adoptive parents were, in fairness, very, very good and told her from day one that she had another mother. Right. And then she used to write to me from she was nine. Now, I didn't get to meet her until she was 25. Um, and we had a good relationship, you know, and she has um, kids of her own, which is lovely. And it's and she always knew that I didn't want to give her up. And that was, you know, why she had such a strong bond. Um, I'll never be her mum. She has her mum, she has her dad, she has her sisters. Um, but but, but, not, part of her life. but the, the reality is, though, you're, you're her biological mother. Yeah, but you know, they, they, it, it just doesn't. It's not. It is and it isn't. It's, it's very difficult to to explain. Um, the relationship's different. Um, as in, like she ha- she has a mum, you know. I'm her biological mum, but she has a mum, 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 mum that she gets Mother's Day cards for and that sort of stuff. And looking back on it now. And once all this controversy broke, um, your own feelings about all that happened to you, I, I presume it was never discussed within your family. Did you ever discuss it in more recent times with your siblings? 
I never really discussed it with them um, until um, until I start I, until I joined the Irish First Mothers yes. and met Cafe Cafe McMahon, the founder of Irish First Mothers, and I never really. I just kept it to myself because I really didn't think that anybody wanted to talk to me about it. Um, from it, it hurt them too much as well, you know. And um, it just um, it, it was just a difficult time for everybody. I think that they they probably weren't allowed to talk about it either. Um, so one I have one sister in particular that would uh, kind of started talking to her a wee bit about it. Mm. Um, and she has actually she's taken it very badly. Um, but um, I haven't really spoke. I'm, first time I told my story was related to, to Fenton and Kathy mm. and um, yourself. And just uh, now, all these years later, do you still have, you know, vivid memories of what might have been the worst time in your life? Well, yeah, because um, after the baby was born, when I did come home, I suffered um, a terrible illness. I, I had a terrible hemorrhage um, because it was after birth left in the womb. And um, I, I almost died. And um, and it was, it was horrific, you know, and I was, a, I was only a week air, like. But it's, as I said, in my um, I have my my full testimony is in irishfirstmothers dot com, and it it goes on to explain um, what happened in the hospital and that sort of stuff. And so, um, it's just a wee bit difficult at the moment. Sure, I appreciate that fully. And can I just ask you? You you said a moment ago that you're now married. Um, yeah. Did you make? Did you and your husband make a conscious decision that you would not have children? No, no, it was just circumstances didn't didn't work out for us. Um, but I I had kind of consciously myself um, um, had decided not to because I just wanted to stay loyal to her. But it was just for myself and Michael. It was just um, um, circumstances. He's a wee bit older than me, so sure. Looking back. Uh, do do you blame the nuns? Do you blame the social workers? Do you blame the system? Do you just blame the type of Ireland that existed back in in the early nineteen eighties, where where it was uh, priest ridden, church driven, and essentially yeah. um, people simply, you know, did what they were told, as you said earlier. Well, it is that, and I mean, um, if anybody is, I don't really want to say much more on the on the thing but if anybody did want to um listen to the full testimony it says about the priest and um an off time that I had with the priest um and I had a really bad time with the social workers. They pushed and they pushed and they pushed um and I always believed that my child had been that her parents had been picked before she was even born. That's very possible indeed. Very, yeah. very possible indeed. Yeah, I have strong belief in that. W- would you be inclined to accept, though, that perhaps the the social workers were themselves uh, driven by, uh, yeah. th- by by their, uh, you know, by their bosses or managers or whomsoever mm-hmm. or by a policy uh, set down by both church and state? Yeah, I believe that, yeah. Because it's very hard to believe that this... We're not talking kind of the 1940s and 50s. We're talking no, the no. 1980s. Yeah. And, you know, it's just... Yeah, they were they were driven to do a job. They were sent to do a job, and that was their job. You know, and there was no... There was no real compassion in it, but... Um, it just seemed that they were sent to get as many babies as they could. That's how I felt. And, you know, it has to be said as well that you're one of the lucky ones in the sense that your daughter was uh, adopted by decent people, given Absolutely. a good life and uh, not a situation where you're today, all these years later, wondering yes. what exactly yes. happened to her. Is she dead or alive? Where is she? Yeah, yeah, I am very lucky. I do consider myself to be very lucky. And um, so she's a lovely girl and um, and very happy and very well balanced. But no doubt, if if she had stayed with you, 
on the basis of this conversation over the last 25 minutes, she would have been equally so. Yeah, I think so. And how are you doing now yourself? Um, I'm doing okay. A uh, few mental health problems, but I, I'm, I'm working on them. And um, would, would that emanate from that experience oh, yeah. all those years ago? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. And um, but then I have I have various people that are on my on my side, and and um, that I'm able to go and talk to. And the Irish first mothers are absolutely fantastic. And if you don't mind me saying, it, I would just urge any girl woman now that's out there that needs to talk, just get in touch because for me um, it's been a massive help a massive help just, you know, there's so many lovely ladies involved mm. and they're all there for each other Indeed they are Look, we have to leave it uh, there, Mary Thank you very, very much indeed for no, talking with you. us uh, this evening and all, all I can do really is uh, wish you well for for the rest of your life and indeed to wish your, your daughter well as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and okay. a, a very good evening to you. And you too. Bye. The Grapevine with Aidan Crowley.